Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Southeast Asia Development Symposium 2021. Now, we at GRAB are honored to be partnering with Asian Development Bank today at this session, where we explore a common topic of interest, how to use tech for good to serve Southeast Asia. It's quite hard to believe that only nine months ago, I was here at this very same place hosting GRAB conversations, only the focus topic then was staying afloat. Whereas today we have already moved on to talk about recovery. The world certainly moves fast. Now, whether you're a working professional or parent, you're likely zoomed out by now, given all the activities that have been moved online to video chat the past year, the bulk of your household shopping, for example, during COVID probably moved from physical trips to supermarkets to online delivery services, be it groceries or food. For me, actually browsing online for loungewear and toys for my puppy were definitely the highlights during a lockdown. But what we're really looking at here is a turbocharged shift to digitalization, presenting immediate opportunities for some business to, businesses to capture new revenue streams during these uncertain times. Others, such as small medium enterprises that were largely reliant on physical sales pre-COVID, find themselves pivoting to new remote sales models online. Now, some sectors were hit hard, such as restaurants, travel, hotels. Others have really thrived, such as grocery and food delivery. The common thread here um, is digital transformation. And today we're really gonna zoom in and look at all of the aspects possible. Now, today at the special edition of Grab Conversations in partnership with ADB, we have assembled an esteemed group of speakers who are experts on digital transformation. They're on the front lines of shaping the recovery agenda across the region through their respective sectors. And I really look forward to my chat with them and introducing them to you. But before that, I'll hand the mic over quickly to Grab's president to welcome you, um, Ming Ma, to say a few words. Over to you, Ming. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Grab Conversation session on the road to recovery with tech. I'm Ming Ma, president of Grab, and I would like to personally thank our panelists for taking the time to share their experiences with us, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. Now, from the Waroons of Indonesia to the Karanderias of the Philippines, this past year has been one of the most testing times for everyone. Yet, it's these entrepreneurs who form the backbone of growth across Southeast Asia. Micro, small, medium-sized businesses made up 97% of all enterprises and 69% of the national labor force in the region over the last decade. In October last year, ADB made a statement that strengthening and supporting these businesses with technology will be the key for the region's recovery from the pandemic. And we believe wholeheartedly um, in that vision. Now, like other tech companies, we at Grab double down on serving the community of everyday entrepreneurs who rely on our platform and those who joined us as jobs were lost and businesses were closed. We've been very focused on helping traditional businesses thrive online in a digital world. In Singapore, we launched a very unique digital mix and match model under our Hawker Center 2.0 initiative that allows consumers to order food from multiple different hawker stalls in one single order. And at the same time, we reduced the cost of food hawkers themselves to sell online through lower overall commissions. In Indonesia, we worked with the Ministry of Agriculture and Pasar Mitra Tani a grocery store that sources fresh produce directly from farmers. Our customers can now order from farmers online and have it directly delivered to their doorstep, shortening the supply chain from farm to table. In Malaysia, uh, Ramadan bazaars are a yearly highlight for everyone, but when they were canceled due to social distancing requirements, we worked with the Selangor state government to bring these traditionally offline bazaar sellers online and facilitated over 66,000 orders. And this was, this was only possible because of the support of our partners and the trust these businesses place with us. Together, we help sellers get accustomed to digital tools like cashless payments and on-demand deliveries. Now, this work is far from over, but there are two key takeaways from these stories. First, 
it's critical to invest in the future of small and micro entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia. They are the backbone of our economy. And when they secede, all of us as a society secedes. And for tech platforms like ourselves, building digital tools is only the first step. The hard part is the ongoing work to ensure that our tech works for the customers and the everyday entrepreneurs that we serve, that tech helps them drive sustained growth and offers a resilient model to help guard against future black swans. Second, we see the power of the collective and the impact of tech for good. Our driver partners, delivery partners, merchants, and social sellers can leverage on the growing demand for online deliveries and digital payments triggered by the pandemic. But this was only made possible because of the support from everyday entrepreneurs and our partners across both the public and the private sectors. We can build on this road to recovery by truly investing in the future of our communities and our collective tech for good. Thank you for listening and I wish all the panelists an enjoyable session. Thank you. Thanks, Ming. Now, ASEAN, um, this is a region with over 600 million people, um, is as, at its most interesting mobile and internet innovation phase. Foreign investors, as well as resource-rich local companies are actually scrambling to maximize market opportunities in this region. Uh, the majority of whom uh, who are living here are young and tech savvy. So it's a really exciting time to look at Southeast Asia uh, and especially the online economy, which has reached a hundred billion for the first time in 2020, uh, according to a report by Tomasek and Google, and is actually projected to triple by 2025. Now today our three speakers are pioneers who are leading the digital economy in Southeast Asia. So allow me the honor to uh, introduce you to the three of them. Let me start with James. Uh, so James Dong is the CEO of Lazada Vietnam. He joined the company in 2018 as the CEO of Lazada Thailand first, where he led the launch of a new social commerce platform called UPIC. Prior to Lazada, he was the head of globalization strategy and corporate development at Alibaba Group and business assistant to the group CEO, Daniel Zhang. Uh, James drove the company's e-commerce globalization strategy and portfolio management, as well as coordinated collaboration between Alibaba and its top 10 global partners. Welcome, James. Um, and then next we have uh, Pandu Shajir, chairman of C Indonesia. Now, Kandu serves as the chairman of C Indonesia. He's also the managing, uh, managing partner of Indies Capital Partners, a leading asset manager in Indonesia. He also is the director of Toba Bara Sejatra, a publicly listed energy enterprise in Indonesia, as well as board member of both Gojek and the Indonesia Stock Exchange. He's also a leading investor in the seed and early growth stage in Southeast Asia. Um, Pandu also volunteers in multiple organizations to promote entrepreneurship and education in Southeast Asia. Last but not least, we have Arev Zionin. He's the founder and CEO of Chope. Now Chope's, um, Chope is a, Chope, Chope CEO, Arif Zayodin, is a born and bred Singaporean on a mission to give diners in Asia the best possible restaurant dining experience. Prior to founding Chope, uh, Arif worked in management consulting and private equity. Over the years, Arif's vision for Chope has steadily transformed the face of F&B across the region by introducing technology as efficiency drivers into what has been a very traditionally run industry, one restaurant at a time. Uh, Arif is a big believer in the notion that a rising tide lifts all boats. Arif is also a committed advocate for the region's tech and startup space. The father of two regularly volunteers his time to mentorship and contributes at industry events across the region. So welcome all three of you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our speakers. Now, let me just start off with uh, a few questions that involve all three of you, and then we can move individually. Now, as I mentioned, Southeast Asia really is a fascinating region at a fascinating time. Uh, with twice the population of USA, um, we're looking at uh, more than 120% mobile penetration in most of the countries, but yet only around 70% of the people, um, they're actually underbanked. So the growth has been strong, but there are many opportunities and there are areas that are developing. But what we're seeing is that there's an ability to leapfrog into digital services. And it started actually way before COVID. So in your respective countries and your sectors, how have you seen digital transformation 
Uh, why don't we start with Arif and then James and then Pandu? Sure. First of all, thank you everyone uh, for, for hosting and, and of course for joining us this afternoon. Now, uh, you know, I think in, in our particular industry, which of course is restaurants uh, and F&B, I think the term leapfrog is exactly right, right? Um, it, it's, it's often perceived as, you know, Asia is catching up with the, the, the Western countries in terms of the technology that uh, small businesses are using. Um, which is to an extent correct, right? I think, I think if you ask about things like Wi-Fi speeds and so on, that's correct. But I think in terms of behavior, the very human behaviors that are involved in eating out, uh, you're actually seeing that many of our users are leapfrogging their Western counterparts and going straight to things like being comfortable with ordering from cloud kitchens for delivery, which a number of the, the, the companies on, on today's call uh, are involved in. Uh, in terms of payment, we're seeing people who walk into restaurants and are willing to whip out their phones and do a mobile payment rather than uh, go, you know, have never had a credit card before, for example. Um, and in, in our particular sphere, you know, are very willing to do things like join a queue from their mobile phone. They have, they have fewer worries about things like, you know, will the restaurant use my data for uh, marketing or, or transfer, uh, a lot more openness. And whether rightfully or wrongfully, I think the behaviors have uh, leapfrogged where uh, the, where, where, we would expect them to go in two to three years and have actually gone straight to where, uh, where some of our more modern counterparts in, in China are already. Mm, now that's really helpful. Um, thank you. What about you, James? What do you think? Yeah, um, maybe I will start by sharing a little story. Right? Um, thank you. At the beginning of the pandemic, actually, I was living in uh, Thailand at the time. Um, when I spent uh, my personal time after work, right, I usually uh, go to shopping malls, just try to observe young people and the sellers there. So I like spend time in a uh, CM Square, CM Center, where a lot of young trendy people would like, love to go. And also there are a lot of local talented Thai designer opening up their boutique stores there. You can't remember how many times, I can't remember how many times that I asked the seller, do you want to open up a store on Lazada so that you can sell outside this shopping mall? and you can sell outside of Bangkok. And very often I got answer, said that, you know, I already have so many customers. I'm already so busy. Um, I probably cannot handle so much more, right? And then the uh, pandemic hits. Um, we launched a uh, Yes I Can campaign um, to help a lot of um, brands and sellers to open store on Lazada free of charge and with a lot of support. And all of a sudden when I browse through the app, you know, two or three, like the, the brands that I really like, they suddenly, you know, they appear on the, on the platform. And, you know, just within a, actually within a month, right, um, more than 40 um, in, uh, good sellers in Siam Center actually registered with us and started selling. So that's how pandemic actually changed the behavior and the mindset of so many people, right, and also the way that they do business. That's really helpful. I'm, so far, very good results. Um, Pandu, you can speak from any angle of uh, the <laughs> sectors that you work in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, since uh, COVID was actually a bit scary, I think March, April uh, time frame, there was so much uncertainty, if I remember. Right? This is one year COVID, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. One year one COVID year. Yep. celebration. That's why we have it, right? And we didn't know what will happen to a lot of our portfolio. So we did a lot of <laughs> stress case. We talked to founders every day. It was almost like uh, uh, I was in a, what is it called? <laughs> you know, in a session where you're like a psychologist, except you also don't know the answer and you have no idea because this is so different than sure. 1998 when we were, when I was in college, that kind of tells you my age. And also in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, because this is a health crisis. So, you know, we were doing, you know, the usual stuff, financial stress testing, everything. Those who has 12 months runway, 18 months runway, 24 months runway. And if you have it, fundraise and, and it's interesting because back in end of March one of the portfolio had zero revenue mm. <laughs> just literally went from 100 to zero right close to zero la two three but you know interestingly May June there was like that light <laughs> a little bit of light and suddenly businesses somehow are moving and a lot as what James mentioned a lot of people are moving offline to online and one interesting thing too is that the government in Indonesia has been very supportive 
of, of technology uh, mm -hmm. to support economic recovery. So we did this thing called Banga Buatan Indonesia, BBI, where all the big platforms work to closely together with the president, uh, Pak Jokowi, and we actually were in two series of meetings with him, all the seven big platforms with Pak Jokowi and said, hey, how do we support small, small medium enterprise? So he said, look guys, you go out there, we, we use this thing, this logo, Bangga Bot to support the SME, the government will use your platform, you know, for both communication, also asking all the governors to help, et cetera. And we launched May 10, within one month, less than one month, we had 1 million of new offline merchants that had never been offline moving to online. And since then, there's been about 10 million of new merchants that came in uh, throughout 2020. It was I mean, it was amazing, you know, it was one of the fastest things that move. And this is everything, right? This is people going to, you know, uh, 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 selling stuff, selling goods, uh, resellers. And, you know, we essentially double down. We meaning every company that involved that I invested in, we ask our founders, please support, right? And it all <laughs> transpired positively. If you look at e-commerce, I think it has essentially the market has doubled then the previous year, better than whatever the expectation of this Google Tomasek report you mentioned. Mm -hmm. 2021 too, this momentum continues. And now working closely with the government, you know, I cannot uh, highlight that, you know, usually in government stuff, you see them as potentially sometimes as an impediment or roadblock here is actually working in sync together. Now, uh, you know, just two weeks ago, uh, us together uh, and us meaning all the technology guys, you know, Lazada included, right? Everyone is helping the government in terms of communicating and helping vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. So before we were involved, it was about 150,000 a day. Today, it's about close to 400,000 a day of people being vaccinated. And we're moving to a million a day of people being vaccinated, right? And, and that's significant from a public-private partnership because they see the impact of what technology companies can do positively mm -hmm. for civil society. So, you know, Ilaria, this one year, it was a big test for civil society. I mean, actually business became a back burner. We, the fact that we can think of business is actually a privilege, right? Because a lot of times you want to think, hey, can I eat tomorrow? I mean, that's the majority of what Indonesians think about. How can I live? You know, when most people don't have the option of staying at home. Correct. The only people that have the option to stay at home is people that are listening to this call essentially. So, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and for us, you know, how can we as technology companies and we become a bigger member of civil society, how can we give more and use the platform that we have to be able to efficiently distribute stuff, whether it's information, whether it's goods, whether it's the movement of money. So, you know, we've been super fortunate to be in the position that we are in. And, you know, all the founders that were involved in, I told them, each one of them, you guys, this is first time in your lifetime, outside of building your business, you can do something more than just, hey, I can get a better valuation, you know? You, yeah. we're, we're trying to bring Indonesia or the country back from essentially March was the abyss, you know? There was essentially hope left, and then now we're bringing hope back. And, you know, you know essentially this one year was, it was an awesome testament of how people working together between civil society. That, that is really wonderful to hear. And, and actually that will lead really well into my next question because people are thinking, of course, given everything that's happened, but also the rich poor gap, tech and non-tech gap have all widened so much, right? And today at the core of what we wanna explore in this topic is really inclusivity, uh, especially yeah. in this region, right? So inclusivity is such a key topic today. Um, and, and whether technology can bring actual prosperity to all, or is it just to a small group of people? So I would love to bounce, bounce a question to you guys. How mm -hmm. inclusive do you really think technology can be in your respective countries, in your respective sectors? Um, you can name examples, but we really would love to hear, especially on Rich Poor Gap and, uh, and gender inclusivity. Why don't we start with Pandu this time and then James and Arif? Yeah, in terms of financial inclusion, uh, I would say also because of uh, COVID, one of the things that the government did is to give uh, direct cash handouts uh, using technology. <laughs> so using all the apps, et cetera, if you want cash, here, open this app, whether it's through one of the government banks and their app application or one of the super app, you can use it. This is the way for you to get your direct cash. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's as efficient as it gets, and that's the fastest way to get financial inclusion, right? <laughs> You're like, here's free cash. And, and you know what's funny? Because that actually touches the bottom of the pyramid. People that, you know, didn't know what this means. People just want to do cash transaction. And rather than cash being transferred from one hand to hand because of COVID, people are afraid. Uh, and most Indonesian, even the bottom of the pyramid, thinks that handphone is more valuable than anything else they own, right? Outside of just, you know, their bed. Uh, mm. uh, uh, it's actually one of the most efficient ways to is to give through their mobile application, right? And now buying stuff too, especially in the top ten big cities in Indonesia, you can buy stuff using a mobile application, right? So the growth of of, of financial inclusion has been quite significant, right? And and that's something where uh, as as you move forward this year is actually how do you use credit to further fuel growth within the small medium enterprise sector. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. The fact right. that the adoption, even including the bottom of the pyramid, has increased tremendously, and 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 right. that's a significant improvement pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, we have to go through uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, teaching them, educating, you know, and essentially paying for educating people. Today, with the government's help as well, people know that this is probably the best way and most efficient way to be able to, to develop their business and also from a day-to-day -day perspective, using that rather than touching money. So you basically think tech can be inclus uh, inclusive and you think it's, it is being catapulted by COVID so that people are now moving faster and quicker into digital. So all in all, you, you think that tech is able to support inclusivity. I, I, I've seen, we've seen the big positive effect of what technology can do in the right way. So yeah, I think in this forum, we're talking the, the positive way, the right way, because technology can go either way, right? Depending on the user sure. and the impact, right? Well, so, feel, feel yeah. free to highlight to later if you guys actually think that there are areas we need to watch out for. But okay, that's Indonesia. Wonderful to hear that. James, what do you think? And, and please feel free to speak from your viewpoint and wisdom from Vietnam, Thailand, and even China. You know, you've, you've had experiences in all of them. Yeah. Do you think that can be inclusive? Is really promoting inclusivity. Um, it's um, it helps tear down the barrier of um, a lot of people, especially like small business owners, individual business people, right, and women, and people you know who live and work in rural areas for them to access to a much bigger business world. We've seen it from you know just all over the places. Um, at the beginning, right, when the pandemic hit the world, um, China was the first uh, country started, uh, you know, uh, react to this. Alibaba Group at that time, you know, in China, we launched a various program, not only help the sellers, but we even go to the rural areas and help them to sell, uh, uh, to sell their uh, uh, fruits, uh, vegetables, so on and so forth, right, to the, to the cities. Um, and then in Southeast Asia, um, you know, we, Eventually, we essentially we're launching a very similar program. So um, what do we see is that um, a lot of the sellers, um, especially the small business owners, in the past that they didn't have capacity, they didn't have the knowledge to operate online business, and now with this uh, supporting package from platforms, right, including Lazada and Shopee, you know, most of the platforms actually they launch a lot of these support programs and incentive uh, packages to help those uh, small business owners and individuals to set up their operation online, right? And, and also, um, this also help a lot of uh, buyers as well, right? Because in, in the past, um, a lot of uh, platforms, their buyers were very much focused on relatively young people who are tech savvy, who mm -hmm. you know, use mobile phone very, very well. But then during the pandemic, um, some of the country got locked down. Vietnam was a little bit lucky, right? So it was more like business as usual for a very long period of time. But for Thailand, you know, a lot of uh, shop, uh, shops got closed down for certain for a very long period of time. So a lot of people just couldn't access to what they want to buy. And then they learn how to use mobile phone, uh, they register, become a user, um, and then they, they shop from the platform. And the platform also try to um, fit into that need, right? So in, instead of, you know, just asking for online payment and so on, we also do cash on delivery. We deliver, uh, try to have the touchless uh, delivery in Vietnam as an example. Right, so that we try to include, you know, everyone from sellers, uh, from buyers, whether they're, you know, in the city or in a rural area, female, male, large, small, you know, we, we just try to, um, you know, uh, make digital use the digital to enable, right, to enable them to help them to business and to carry on their daily life as usual. Mm. So it's it really I think for you is really like it's mo mobilization. 
it's having, you know, really having a very steady and scalable way for these merchants to be able to make money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I feel like uh, one more thing I just would like to uh, highlight here, right? It makes things happen so much faster. Mm. Um, so if you step back a little, right? If you look at the online consumption as a percentage of total consumption, uh, this number in the US probably now is around 15%. In China is about 20-ish percent, right? Um, so in Southeast Asia, different countries, probably around 5% plus minus. Um, so before the pandemic, um, you know, it was during the end of the year and I was discussing a lot of CEOs about, you know, their business on online platform. And they were saying, you know, maybe in 10 years, the online penetration will be like that in China or US. But with this pandemic, right, everything changed. You know, right after pandemic hits, I got a lot of calls from uh, different business owners and they were saying, hey, James, what should I do? You know, there's clearly a capability gap, you know, on infrastructure, on people, how, how to operate online, and also on a lot of business decisions, like uh, how to deal with online and offline price, differentiation, so on and so forth, right? They were just not so ready. But then, you know, but they have to do it. And then in the next three, six, nine months, now gradually figure out. And for a lot of brands and sellers, their online, uh, their online share grew from single digits to 10, 20, 30%. Some of them even past 50%. Mm. Right? I, I, I don't have to name it everyone because there are so many of them. So uh, a lot, uh, very often that I heard people say, you know, future is now <laughs> because the, the, the whole thing just make, not, make it not only inclusive, but actually make the transformation so much faster. Mm, no, thank you. Speed for sure. Uh, very important, especially in Asia where I do think the West doesn't marvel at the speed at which things go in Asia. Arif, what do you think? And I know you, you restaurants in your network span over Hong Kong, China, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore. Feel free to speak from any of their perspective too, but how inclusive do you think technology can be? Well, I think inclusivity is is kind of a win-win uh, outcome for, for the businesses, the platforms, and the users, right? Um, you know, when we talk about inclusivity, we, we, we sort of frame it as something that is uh, altruistic or charitable. The, the truth is that the bottom of the pyramid is a very difficult place to make money as a, <laughs> as a platform business. I think a lot of us um, you know, we, we, we face this problem, whether it's a, a e-commerce or it's a SaaS business uh, approaching B2B, B2C. Um, the bottom of the pyramid in Southeast Asia is inherently a, a, a very low price point relative to, to other geographies and other segments. So, so I think often it's perceived by, by you know, your, your financial minded uh, VCs and PE investors that uh, the returns on that segment are, are perhaps not, um, not as, as good. But of course, it takes a, a more visionary type of investor and, and entrepreneur, I think, which many of the people on today's call are, to, to realize that that is the opportunity in Southeast Asia, right? We're not talking about making a, a quick buck today and then flipping a business uh, tomorrow. We're talking about investing and growing the bottom of the pyramid to become uh, a, 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 a income generating middle class that is growing and the business that you have built, the platform that you have built as, an, uh, as a technology company is growing alongside them. So, so there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem to that, right? Um, getting in to, to that uh, bottom of the pyramid uh, segment today requires substantial investment uh, because you're not going to, you know, you're not going to generate good returns enough to, to, to power and, and, and get the flywheel spinning just yet. And it takes uh, visionary investors to, to start that flywheel spinning. And I think that's the job, uh, or that's the discussion that, that we're having with the many thousands of people who are on, on today's call, right? Many of them are thinking about it from that perspective. Why would I want to invest Southeast Asia knowing it's such a mass market, such a mm. low margin business there? And I, I, I promise you that that is the opportunity. And financial inclusivity is a side effect, a beautiful side effect. Of, of a, growing a successful business and growing a successful economy across all these countries. Now, I will say that not all the cities uh, have the same problem, right? You've obviously identified that we work in a variety. And Southeast Asia is sort of a disparate set of geographies. You have Singapore Correct. and Hong Kong, which are very, very affluent. And, you know, I think talking about financial inclusivity there sometimes is a bit strange when you compare it to Indonesia or, or Thailand or, or Vietnam. 
but but still, I think the, the the problem does exist, right? People don't realize that there are there are still tons of small businesses that exist in Singapore and Hong Kong, from your hawkers to your sasan things that Chuk works with yeah. every day. We work with and we work with empowering them to to build digital presence. That you know they're like, why would I need that? Like a, a website, why would I need it? And we have to educate them as as, as these other guys have been saying. So so. Don't, don't be fooled into thinking, okay, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand is an opportunity. There is still a lot of, of mass market uh, and inclusivity needed in, uh, in, in all the countries in Southeast Asia. Thanks for bringing that up. And later on, we'll come back to, to some of the points you made. In fact, I think when I go to Bali, which you have presence in, it is not Indonesia. <laughs> It's so expensive. I mean, everything is like catered to like people who flew in from Paris and London and, and then you kind of fly one hour and it's a very different place. But that's a beauty, like you said, of Southeast Asia. Now, then the next, next question, I would love a quick kind of two sentence um, kind of lightning answer from you. But this will kind of press in a little because we don't want to just talk about super positive stuff. We'd love to hear from you guys on anything we need to watch out for or a challenge. Given what you guys have just said, right? It, tech platforms can be scalable, can be so inclusive. People do move very fast and I do agree. How resilient then do you think, right? Our tech platforms as revenue drivers for, for these companies? Like, can it really last? Is it, does, is it sustainable for them? And if, if yes, great, but if not, like um, what are some one or two things they need to watch out for in order to keep this resilient um, revenue driving model going? We're gonna start with RF this time and then James and Pandu. Yeah, I mean, my, my quick answer is that the acceleration in the behavior of people and businesses in going online is not a COVID driven trend, right? We're not gonna see it come back to you know, normal in 24 months when, when life goes back to normal. It, he's accelerated something that was already happening. People have been going online. And if you, if you don't believe that, then you're already behind the curve. It's already too late for you. You don't think that businesses are going online, people are going online. Right. So I, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer question. Yeah, it's, it, digital is obviously the future. It's just how fast mm. we think. Got it. Great. James? Yeah, to me, actually, it's, uh, it's a little bit similar, right? After COVID, when I see um, people started talking about offline again, because, you know, everything goes back to usual and then they need to start rebalancing. But then I would always say, just keep the big picture in your mind because you already see how, how it is going. And then in two, three years, it's going to be there. It, it's not going to take 10 years as it did in the U.S. and in China, right? So we, you better be ready. Sounds good. Pandu? I think you're talking about the bad stuff here. Good stuff or bad stuff? Good it's stuff. up to you. It's up to you. I think, you know, one thing that I'm learning now and the time I spend the most now is actually on stakeholder engagement. Because as the technology becomes more pronounced in civil society, uh, one thing we have to also be sensitive about is that people, and this is civil society in general, right, uh, are being more concerned about the power of technology companies. So I right. probably spend an inordinate amount of time communicating uh, how technology can be a positive change. And obviously there can be things for negative change, right? And that's probably what, that's especially now that FinTech is playing a bigger role, right? The last 12 months, right? As given COVID. So I would say, I, I, Ilaria, I don't know, the last six months, there hasn't been a day without I spend with regulators, people, parliament members, parliament head, talking about the positive of technology. And obviously back to the technology companies, what is their intent? What is our intent? Because there can always be bad apple. I mean, All obviously right. the people that you are curating today are good actors. We never discuss about bad actors, but just like in any anything, right? If you have a pool of water and you just have one uh, poison, the entire well can be poisonous. So, you know, uh, it is our job, I think, in, in, in the, in, and I guess the people that are in this uh, audience, people that are audience of technology can inherently be very good. But you also have to be careful that not everyone using it for that. And back to the intent of each one of us, right? Because once it becomes regulation comes in and regulation it follows, right? Usually it follows how the technology improvement that can be your biggest impediment, right? Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. and and you have to work extremely closely i would say <laughs> with your stakeholders right. one thing i'm now learning very fast and as mm. i mentioned there is not a single day i'm not talking to a member of a civil society leader today talking about technology that That's is like key. first, that is first key. and foremost top of mind and for all of our founders too yes if you're in early stage of growth you are privileged not to be involved in that right if you are in late stage and already growth company or publicly listed you're privileged that every day you have to handle that <laughs> so you know this is the this is the power of technology and i think today technology companies i mentioned this uh, already in many other instances today technology companies in indonesia is bigger than telecommunication companies in indonesia by market capitalization all right all right is that important right as part so of i'm a, i'm a, hearing a yes to resilience i'm hearing important um, public uh, private partnership i'm hearing customers need to have wisdom to to decipher you know whether the player and the tech platform has their interests or not and and whether they should do business with them thank you now i'm going to move on to the next segment to kind of ask some individual questions because i'm sure the audience would also really be curious to dive in a little bit um and i would love to start with rf because you know, we are coming at the tail end of, well, I don't even know if I should say tail end, depending which country you're in, if you're in Singapore and Hong Kong, um, yes, you're at the tail end of COVID and some countries are trying to, to still recover. Um, but your don't sector- jinx, Don't jinx it, Ilaria. I know, sirs. Well, I'm sitting in San Francisco and I haven't left this apartment in a week. So um, you guys cannot complain. <laughs> but I think, you know, what you, you're doing, right? Chope, is a platform that diners use to discover book tables, get deals um, at restaurants and cafes, and and you you're being used by over like two thousand restaurants. That that's a lot. And uh, and your sector, however, has been arguably maybe hit the hardest, especially at the beginning. And later on, I guess there's different people are doing different things with it. I would love to hear just how have your restaurant owners in your network uh, been coping? How have they been progressing? And where are they now? Yeah, so, you know, in, in, in our particular industry, um, it, it's been a particularly uh, up and down situation. Uh, it, it, it couldn't have been a worse outcome over the lockdown periods in the various countries. And that obviously has been different by country, right? So, so in Singapore, for example, where, where we're headquartered, um, it was a relatively short lockdown for, for three months, uh, from April till June, I want to say. And elsewhere, it's been a much longer and harder journey. Um, so places like, uh, especially tourist markets like Bali and Phuket, have not even opened up to tourism yet. And I, I, my heart really goes out to the, you know, especially the small, medium businesses. Not, not so much, uh, you know, I think the holding power of the large uh, hotel groups and chains, obviously, uh, is there, but for there, there are thousands of small businesses that we work with in, in tourist markets that are just unsustainable right now. And, mm. and people are really asking how they're going to continue um, feeding themselves and their families. So, so and it's no fault of their own, right? So you really have a variety of outcomes here in Singapore. People are eating out, you know, Ilaria, you haven't come back to Singapore yet, but if you were here, I promise you every, twice a day, seven days a week, uh, you would be eating out because that is the only thing you can do now. Mm. There are no concerts. There are no, well, there are very few concerts. There are, you know, festivals. There are very few weddings. And forget about going on holiday. So the only thing people are doing nowadays in, in, in market. So I think that behavior, we've seen it happen in Singapore. We've seen it happen in uh, Hong Kong as, as uh, dining reopened. Uh, and then, you know, Hong Kong would be very up and down, um, no, no comment, of course, on, on how they've handled the, 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 the pandemic, but uh, the behavior, of course, is, is exactly corresponding to, to lockdown. So it's been very up and down. Same thing for, for Jakarta. You know, we've seen uh, the market reopen and then go into lockdown several times over the last few months. And, and what we see, the pattern, which is now undeniable, is that as soon as markets reopen, people are going out again with a vengeance, you know, that that term mm. revenge spending, it's real. It's real. People want to go out. They want to connect with other human beings and eating out is one of the few ways they can do it. So the thousands of restaurants that we work with, they're holding on, waiting for that moment to come and it can't come too soon, right? So, so I think the, the answer is during this period when you are really severely affected, 
you really have to do every make you know move heaven and earth to make sure that you can survive through the months of lockdown because coming yeah. at the end of that the survivors will be the ones that reap the rewards when people go out again right the people who can who can tahan through the the crisis and get through the other side of it um and how do you how do you survive through it you know you can talk about efficiencies and tweaking it but honest the honest truth is that that's tweaking at the edge right any technology benefit I'll tell you right now, our main job is to build restaurant management systems for, for, for restaurants. But there's nothing that we can do to help your restaurant survive when the government says yeah. restaurants can survive, right? I can improve your revenue by 15% year on year through efficiencies. But if your restaurant can't open, I can't do anything. So technology is not, is, is, is not the solution here. It's really, about, uh, it's really about the story of human perseverance and, and the story of entrepreneurs on a, a small, medium business scale. You really have to you know, get, get your wits together and survive it. Technology is not going to help you get through that. But when you do, the rewards will be the, for, for, for the people who survive. That's um, true. And, so, so and I, I in, in the F&B industry right now across, across Southeast Asia. And I really do love that you say people are going out with a vengeance. And I hope that that is uh, equally applicable to the smaller cafe, smaller, you know, uh, eateries, as well as the large ones. Do you see that? I guess maybe you're referring yeah. to Singapore. So it's, no, no. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's the same in all the cities. The behavior is remarkably similar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and food is the great equalizer. We talk about inclusivity, but, you know, what's more inclusive than food, right? Everybody, no matter whether you're a, you're, you're, you're a truck driver or a billionaire, you love the same whatever, tahu yeah. goreng, same mee goreng at that, 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 that hawker center. So, so the answer is that, that, that the cafes and the small uh, hawker centers are, are the ones that are, are also benefiting from this, this, this surge in revenge spending. If you look at the, the number of complaints my friends sent to me on WhatsApp uh, nowadays is, you know, I can't find a place to eat out. And they're not talking about Michelin star restaurants. They're talking about small, they're like, they just can't find any, any availability right now because mm. the, everyone is going out. So, so everyone's benefiting from it, I would say. Um, and, and I think suddenly, you know, Chok has been an indirect beneficiary of that. We, we've seen business come back over 40% year on year uh, in the second half of 2020 uh, versus the uh, previous year. And, and it, you know, we're, we're trying our best to, to, to spread people across and, and, and help the restaurant industry as, as best we can because it is a pretty, mm. pretty incredible swing from like, you know, real morbid, like death and, and destruction and pandemic sure. to, to how do we, we can't even fit all the people who want to come in in. No, that is a great problem to have too. And, and to be able to have a platform for you to have trans for customers of transparency, right? To see if we, the first choice restaurant is full, what is the second, third, fourth to, to match demand and supply. Now, Arif, so in terms of um, digital adoption, right? So you mentioned the Hawker centers, the stands, right? Do, are, are those guys online with you? I mean, how, how are they uh, adopting digitally? I think you've, as I you come back to the point I said earlier, right, this is the segment that I think the greatest upside exists in, in Southeast Asia. You know, with all due respect to my esteemed colleagues, uh, Rosada and C, these guys have done it for e-commerce, but for the offline to online businesses, for the lifestyle businesses, there is still a huge amount of upside. And yes, I, I realize that at some point in, in our life where we we can aspire to being as gigantic as these guys. I might be spending more of my time on, on calls with, uh, you know, uh, MPs and, and cabinet ministers and so on. But at this point, the, you know, I, I think I see the next five years, someone is going to create a gigantic company that is serving the needs of this segment. We hope it's us or someone on this call mm. is going to do it, but, you know, okay. someone's going to do it. So the hawkers, the street vendors, the guys who are selling your, your bucks on me, they, they're just at the tip of the iceberg of digital adoption. And oh. everyone is trying to crack that. I think it's, it's, the wave is coming, right? I, I've been doing this for a number of years now. I can feel um, this, this, this wave is coming, yeah. Well, you do know that there are thousands of people who've signed up to the symposium. So a lot of people will be holding you accountable on the things that you've suggested. And hopefully you'll be part of the solution. And I'm sure you will be. Thank you so much for giving us- I thought us it was a closed door session. No way, man, wide oh. open. <laughs> No, it's it's good. So everybody here, um, you know, we're, we have great hopes for for Choke to to help with this too. But Thank wonderful you. point, honestly. Um, I I think the backbone of the Southeast Asian, especially F and B industry, has to include, if not put in the forefront, the hawkers, the uncles and aunties who are 
you know, just operating the mom and pop shop. Um, now let's move on to James. Um, thank you, um, Arif. Uh, James, you've had such a rich experience with e-commerce, right? You, you know, going from China to Thailand to Vietnam. I am amazed that actually Vietnam hardly suffered during COVID. I heard that um, the lockdown finished in April, 2020, which essentially is like one month or two months into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was looking right into stats about um, first time internet users adoption, uh, it says that actually Vietnam had a staggering like 41% um, first time internet users. Uh, and, and that is especially important because users in Vietnam were not forced to go online because they're on lockdown. If they were already free as of April 2020, yet there are still so many first time Internet users coming in. We're actually seeing a very organic, fundamental trend of people just wanting to go online, buy stuff, explore um, online um, commerce activity. I I'd love to just hear you compare and tell us why does Vietnam behave like this, right? Where does this aggressive online spending growth come from and how do you compare it versus like China and Thailand since, since you have just extensive leadership um, in, in all three countries in this space? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I feel um, there is one fundamental driver and then also accelerator, right? So the, the, the fundamental is that, um, you know, in the last few years uh, with the boom of smartphone, the internet, social network, um, digital technology and the digital transformation have developed really rapidly in Vietnam, right? So compared to the other Southeast Asian countries, probably it started a little bit later. It was slower at the beginning, but the last one or two years, the growth speed was already faster than Southeast Asia average. So that's actually one of the uh, most fundamental uh, reason, right? And then COVID certainly it is the accelerator. It's actually accelerating this not only in Vietnam, but also other Southeast Asian countries as well, right? But in Vietnam uh, specifically, right? Um, the, as you said, right, the whole lockdown and pandemic is only like one month. So at the very beginning, um, we, we, we saw a lot of users, they started uh, coming to our platform. So our traffic actually dramatically uh, dramatically increased. I think that that's the reason it, it's, it's not a, it's not because of a panic buy. Actually, we didn't really observe panic buy. So mm -hmm. traffic increased dramatically, um, but the um, sales per user didn't increase that much. And that's also aligned with uh, the offline shopping behavior as well, right? There's very little um, panic buy in offline supermarkets, for example. So um, consumers, they're still, um, you know, shop smartly. And um, and I think the, uh, the 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 reason why they they also choose to spend online uh, spend more time online is that they, they they are more cautious, right? So they they answer to the uh, government's uh, suggestion that you even you know you, you can you can still go to work uh, usually as normal, right? But uh, they they were recommended that to stay at home and try to reduce unnecessary activities outdoors. So we saw that uh, huge traffic but not so much uh, purchasing. Hmm. Uh, but then another um, part of this growth is actually empowered by supply side, right? As I said, um, you know, we've observed a lot of brands and sellers, they, they come online uh, very, uh, you know, much faster than the buyer side. Actually, the growth on the supply side is almost two times than the growth on the, on the buyer side. So wow. a lot of them, they bring their customers, right? And assortment also will, um, you know, drive the total growth of the entire platform. And then everything goes back to normal around May, June-ish, right? Go back to the previous growth trajectory, which was already uh, much higher than, uh, you know, the other, uh, the other countries. So that's, that's the Vietnam situation. And in Thailand, it's actually very, very different, very different. So when the pandemic started hit, hit, hits, uh, the situation was a lot worse. And there was a uh, lockdown, work from home for a very long period of time, right? So um, we also saw even faster uh, user acquisition in Thailand hmm. in the first one or two months. And then there's actually absolutely a panic buy in grocery. So I actually did a quick, uh, you know, I did some number of crunching. So the, um, the basket size almost doubled or even more than doubled, right? In the, in the first one month on the grocery side. And then uh, people spend um, longer time shopping online than before. 
And then, uh, you know, the, the shopping actually behavior changed over time. Um, at the beginning, you know, there's only one or two months with this grocery panic shopping. And then once everyone has uh, stocked at home, then they gradually move to electronics. Mm. Um, payments, right? Large screen TV, game console, um, a lot of these things. Um, and, and also cooking as well, right? Um, yeah. You know, kitchenware. Um, yeah, and then also live streaming become, became so popular in Thailand. Um, people, you know, besides, you know, buying stuff, uh, after a few weeks or months, you know, they, they run out of uh, stuff to buy. So they, they watch live streaming on our platform as well. Um, so uh, that growth was very much faster than that in Vietnam, right? And on the supply side, it's even more, right? You know, the little example that I shared at the very beginning is just a snapshot of what's happening on the supply side. Um, so the supply side grows so much faster. I've never seen so faster growth in uh, Thailand Lazada history before within. Mm. But then, you know, of course, uh, from September-ish, you know, everything slightly goes back to normal and uh, the, the whole growth trajectory goes back to the previous, you know, uh, trajectory. So I guess that's uh, what was happening, right? So in summary, I would say um, the fundamental was there for faster growth. Pandemic uh, mm. was a acceleration on the traffic acquisition, and then the supply side um, helped to bring uh, even more traffic into this and also help the platform to, to, to engage with th these buyers so much better. And then all these new features like live streaming, entertainment, so on and so forth, it helped e-commerce platforms to provide more diversified service and offerings to the, to the consumers. So right. all of this actually helped this uh, you know, 41%. You no, know, that's that's super helpful. I'm just curious. Do you do you think Vietnamese people fundamentally, compared to the rest of Southeast Asia, are more savvy in spending? Maybe because there's you have a huge young population, or do you think it's it's not really? You think every most of this comparable to other countries? Um, I think they are. Uh, yeah, I, I think they are a little bit more uh, savvy and also smart um, mm. in terms of. Um, because it's actually not only online, right? When I talk with all these on offline retailers and brand brand owners, um, we clearly see a um, suppression, especially at the beginning, right? And, and also, I think this is aligned with the uh, purchasing power of Vietnamese consumers. Because even though you know we had a very fast growth in the past few years, but if you look at the GDP per capita, um, it is still relatively low. Right. Mm. Um, so it's at the beginning of a very fast growth period. Um, so therefore, you know, I, I would say they're still smart, ma making smart decisions right now. But yes. the growth in the next uh, few years would be a little bit faster than before. Mm. That's a great, great thing to look forward to. Thank you so much, James. I'm conscious of time, um, but, you know, definitely would love to uh, go to Pandu and then round up today's session with with a question from the audience uh, to, to our three esteemed speakers. Now, Pandu, um, to say that you have eclectic roles is, is a huge understatement. Um, but really, just looking at the kind of renaissance man you are, right, with your position with C, with Gojek, with Stock Exchange, and actually with mining as well, um, you, you're going to kind of jack of all trades from upstream to downstream. I'd love to pick your brain a little bit on looking at the old economy versus the new in, in Indonesia, right? How, in your opinion, can this era of tech platforms um, transform, transform how commerce is done in Indonesia? And, and feel free to pick an example. Yeah, I think if you look at even mining or energy business, it has changed a lot. I would say the last 10 to 12, 10 years, right? Since when I first uh, joined the industry, it's actually our family business. While well, the technology is my own business, so you know, two different things, but still. Family's family, you know, Larry, you got to live forever with family. So still got to take care of them. But the one thing that's clear, actually now is no longer about just dig, sell, dig, sell. The idea is that if you are thinking about mining as well, how can you build more downstream industry? So I'll give you an example, nickel. Nickel Indonesia is the largest nickel exporter and right. one of the largest, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, reserve in the world. We have the opportunity to also be one of the largest battery manufacturer for EV in the world. So today, 
uh, the gov what the government is doing along with the private sector is to go end to end. Imagine if you can have the entire two wheeler, four wheeler in Indonesia to all be led by electric vehicle. And that's not small, right? If you consider the market for two wheeler in Indonesia, it's probably, I mean, if you look at Toyota, the largest is Indonesia, number one. So, you know, is that significant for any global uh, auto manufacturer? And the opportunity for a country like ours is to be able to control the supply chain all the way from upstream, all the way to downstream. And that's where technology plays in. Who is the best in terms of the, the, the battery provider, battery technology provider, uh, in terms of using converting nickel all the way to become one of the uh, main supplier of battery, which then later on can convert so from B to B, which later on go to B to C. So this is where the opportunity lies. And I think that will lead to significant investment. It already is, already is. And, and, and that's why there's a lot of stories going on today, a lot of uh, investment coming in, both from the US as well as in, from China and Japan. Uh, because now, the, as you know, mining in the world, uh, people always fight and go to war uh, for scarcity value, right? And the yeah. nickel you know, has become a big scarcity value. If you believe that in the next two decades, everyone will be driving electric vehicle, nickel is probably one of the most important uh, 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 parts, right? So anyway, that's one, one good example of an old economy that is transforming into where the new economy leads today. So I'll stop there. No, that's really helpful. And in fact, I, I was in awe when I was reading about this nickel thing because it's, it's quite a game changer too for, um, for the whole region on how we move on with EV. But, but this, yeah, like you said, this old economy versus new economy, it requires so much orchestration and partnership between um, the public and private sector. Now we only have four minutes left and I think that um, the best way to use it is I also do another lightning round about a minute each um, and we will, is the most important thing I think unanimously is that um, through tech, we wanna uplift the masses. We wanna bring up the small guys. We wanna make sure that extra attention even is given to the small um, merchants. Um, and, and so in your respective sector or you can actually address all sectors too. What is uh, one piece of advice you would give to a small merchant who is trying to use tech as a tool to, to recover their revenue, right? Who wants a sustainable business? What, what piece of advice would you give to a small, mer a small merchant? Um, why don't we start with uh, James and then um, Arif and then Pandu? Yeah, um, I would say just start, just start doing it and try to grab as much support from the platforms um, like Lazada, Shopee, um, and all the other different platforms, right? They all provide so much support nowadays. Um, yeah, just leverage all these resources that you can start right now. That, was, that would be my best uh, suggestion. Yes, and Lazada will be by your side. No, thank you, James. I think Arif? the, yeah, for, for, for me, it's, it's really, uh, my, my advice would be like, try and solve the problem that's keeping you awake at night first. I've seen solutions for in the restaurant industry, solutions for, for everything from how to reduce your lighting bill, waste food, uh, everything. So, I, I, you know, and every restaurant is different. And, and I always tell them we can't go in with a single solution for that, that's going to change the F&B industry. You have to figure out what you need to solve your biggest problem. And then there's a technology out there that will help. And it may not be us, by the way, but, but you know, the, we're not trying to sell, we're trying to change, change the industry here. Sure, so I'm empowering them to, to be just ruthless really and finding out how to survive. Yeah, find the right thing for them, right? Right. Don't use no. the hammer to, to do a screwdriver's job. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Pandu? I think now for a lot of people and small and medium enterprises and those that listen, I think COVID really tested all of us. And I think this, this applies if you're a business person, if you're an employee, if you're an entrepreneur, you are a civil servant, if we don't change somebody, somebody or something will change us. So it is our job to become amenable. It's our job also to change uh, reflecting what the world is today, given what COVID uh, has given us, right? So I think the only thing is uh, learn to listen, learn also to change when things are needed to change. And I think those that are able to adapt the fastest, and adapt also adapt well to the new uh, new normal or the new environment, they ought to be the one that also will be the first one to succeed. Right? And I think this is obviously very easy to say, but very difficult to do, 
right? Because a lot of times it's also mental, right? And also this is the one thing that also with COVID, a lot of times you also have to look after your own, right? And this is everything, not just a business wide, your own self and see whether you're ready to change. That's the only thing, uh, parting advice that I can probably share with everyone here. There's a lot of wisdom for us to end on. I mean, we're perfectly on time now. Um, thank you all three of you so much. I, I think my comment to wrap this panel is that we're all still work in progress. Um, to everyone out there, like nobody has it all figured out yet, but um, we can rest be assured that there are many people who are creating, operating, thinking of and building really great businesses and really lend, you know, these three guys, right? They're very capable. They're very humble too. And, and you can hear from just their brief sharing today that um, they're constantly trying to find new solutions and um, in evolving. Um, so reach out, um, voice out your opinion. If you're a merchant, definitely um, listen to the advice and, and use the tools and, and express your opinion. We're all in this together. And, and I just really can't wait to see what the next five to 10 years, how much growth and how much um, more this region will mature in every aspect um, with the partnership between public and private sector. So thank you so much, Pandu, Arif and James. What an honor to be able to chat with you. Uh, we'll wrap today's uh, panel session. Thank you so much.